Hi, welcome to Periodic Table Review Part 2. My name is Dr. English. Today in this review we're going to be looking at an overview of group properties and trends. Specifically, we're going to be looking at Group 1, the alkali metals, Group 2, the alkaline earth metals, Groups 3 through 12, which we know as the transition metals, Group 14, the carbon group, Group 15, the nitrogen group, 16, the oxygen group, 17, the halogens, and finally, group 18, the noble gases. So let's start off by talking about group one, the alkali metals. This is what you need to know about this group. They are the most reactive metals on the periodic table. They only have one valence electron, which is really, really important to notice. And you can see that one valence electron by looking at the end of the electron configuration, like we have over here, and all of these elements end with the number one. So as we go down the group, they all end in the number one, which means they have one valence electron. They lose electrons to form positive ions, and again, we can see this. By looking at the upper right-hand corner, we can see that all of these elements that are in group one have a plus one charge, which means when they lose this one valence electron right here, they're going to have an overall charge of plus one. They are never found alone in nature. They are always going to be part of an ionic compound with nonmetals. They have low ionization energies, which means it does not take a lot of energy to remove that valence electron, and they have low electronegativities, which means they're not going to attract electrons to themselves. Both of these trends can be found on table S of your reference table. So all you need to do to figure out these two trends is to pick three of the elements out of this group and look at the data that's provided for you on table S to figure out that general trend. They have increased reactivity as one moves down the group. In other words, lithium reacting with water will be good, it'll be exciting, but not as exciting as cesium reacting with water. While lithium might boil and bubble a little bit and look cool, cesium is so reactive that it might blow out the side of a glass dish. Group one is more reactive than group two, and francium is the most reactive metal on the periodic table. Now let's talk about group two the alkaline earth metals. These metals are less reactive than metals in group one. They have two valence electrons, two valence electrons, and again, we can see this by looking at the last number of the electron configuration, and they all end with the number two. Again, they will also lose electrons to form positive ions. We can see the positive ion formed plus two for all of these elements. They can be found in nature by themselves, but these elements are going to react pretty quickly with the oxygen in the air to get a little bit of a coating on the outside of them. They have low electronegativities and ionization energies. Groups three through 12 involve the transition metals. These are metals with multiple oxidation states. So some only have one, like zinc and silver, if we look at them here, silver has a plus one charge, zinc has a plus two charge, and there's other ones in here that have only one charge. But some of them, like vanadium, can be plus two, plus three, plus four, and plus five, or molybdenum, plus three or plus six, um, manganese, plus two, plus three, plus four, and plus seven. So the majority of the elements found in groups three through 12 will have a number of different oxidation states associated with them. Typically, these are hard solids with high melting points. The only exception to this, of course, is mercury, which is located right here. Mercury is a liquid, a liquid at STP. So at standard temperature and pressure, mercury will be a liquid. They are less reactive metals than those in groups one and two. These are the metals that are involved in the coins that we use or the jewelry that we wear. The next thing that you need to know about these ions is that they form ions that are associated with color in aqueous solutions. So if I had like cobalt two chloride, cobalt is typically blue. Iron in a solution is typically red. So many of these elements, if they are involved in ionic compounds and then those ionic compounds dissolve, the solutions that are formed will have a color associated with them. The charge of a transition metal in an ionic compound must, must be identified by a Roman numeral. So you can't just say iron oxide, instead, for iron oxide, I would have to either say iron two oxide, which will get me the chemical formula FeO, or iron 
3 oxide, which will give me the formula Fe2O3. If you just write iron oxide, I don't know if you're referring to FeO as your formula or Fe2O3 as your formula. So for many of the transition metals, you have to be very specific and use a Roman numeral in the name to identify which of these oxidation states that you're using. Now let's talk about group 14, the carbon group. This group involves carbon, silicon, germanium, tin, and lead. The characteristics is that they're all going to have four valence electrons. And again, we can look at the end of the electron configurations for the, all the elements in this group and see that they end in the number four. So each of these elements has four valence electrons. Carbon is our non-metal. The pure elemental form of carbon can exist in a number of different allotropes. They can exist as a diamond or graphite. This means they can have more than one structure in the same phase. That is the definition of an allotrope, and it's very important to know what an allotrope is. Silicon and germanium are metalloids, and the remaining members of lead and tin are both metals. This is a good group to examine in detail because this is one of those groups that you really need to know what's a non-metal, what are your metalloids, and then what are your metals. Because as we look at this group, you can see that trend of increasing metallic character as you go down a group. So being able to differentiate the different classes of elements that are involved in this group, very important thing to know how to do. Now let's talk about group 15, the nitrogen group. Involved in this group is nitrogen, phosphorus, arsenic, antimony, and bismuth. Each of these elements is going to have five valence electrons, and the most common charge for these particular elements is negative three. Yes, there are definitely other ones listed, but since they have five valence electrons, it's much easier to gain three electrons to get its full octet. So when in doubt, go with negative three, unless you're dealing with a situation where it's not negative three. Nitrogen and phosphorus are going to be our nonmetals. So nitrogen and phosphorus here are our nonmetals. Arsenic and antimony are going to be our metalloids. So right here, arsenic and antimony are going to be our metalloids. And finally, bismuth is going to be our metal down here. Again, this is a really good group to be able to look at and differentiate the different categories of elements that you start with the non-metals, you go on to the metalloids, and then you end up with metals at the bottom. A good group to understand that the metallic trend increases as you go down the group. Now let's talk about group 16, the oxygen group. This includes oxygen, sulfur, selenium, tellurium, and polonium. Each of these are going to have six valence electrons. And again, we can look at that outermost number and see the six represented as the valence electrons. Oxygen has two allotropic forms. It can exist either as O2, which is our elemental form of oxygen, or O3, which is ozone. So oxygen, sulfur, and selenium are all nonmetals. So oxygen, sulfur, selenium, all nonmetals. Tellurium is our metalloid, which is right here. And then polonium at the end is our metal. So again, we see that increasing metallic character as you go down a group. Now we're at group 17, the halogens. All members in this group are nonmetals. They easily gain electrons, they exist as diatomics, do not exist in nature as individual atoms. That's really important. These are going to be represented as diatomics, so your F2, your Br2, your Cl2. They have seven valence electrons. Again, we can see this as the last number here is all represented by the number seven. They have high electronegativities and ionization energies. So they have the great ability to attract electrons to themselves and it takes a lot of energy to remove one of those outer valence electrons. Fluorine is the most electronegative and reactive nonmetal on the periodic table. At room temperature, fluorine and chlorine are going to be gases. Bromine is a liquid and iodine is a solid. This is key, so this is all at STP. Don't assume that all elements in group 17 are gases. They are not. And finally, we have group 18, the noble gases. They exist as monatomic molecules, where the mono means one and the atomic means atom. So these are one atom molecules. They have a complete outer valence shell of eight electrons with the exception of helium because we know in that first shell the maximum number of electrons that you can have is two. 
They are chemically non-reactive, so we call that inert, with the exception being xenon and krypton. Those two elements under extreme pressure and temperature will react with fluorine. And we can see this because krypton does have a charge of plus two and xenon does have other oxidation states associated with it. Other than that, the elements of this group are pretty non-reactive. So what did we learn in this brief tutorial? We went over the general properties of the alkali metals, the alkali earth metals, the transition metals, the carbon group, the nitrogen group, the oxygen group, the halogens, and finally the noble gases. Need more help? Feel free to contact me. Have a great day.